and it starts out with the title of The Birth of Jesus Foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to the virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could be meaning. first chapter of the book of Luke. While you're doing that, I have a question for you. Do you have a plan for your life? Do you have a list of things you hope to accomplish? Do you have a bucket list? Perhaps finish an education, high school, college, doctor degree, or maybe family plans, getting married, having children, helping your children raise your grandchildren, perhaps a career moving up in life, or perhaps recreation, making plans for that perfect vacation site, or perhaps lifestyle goals, losing weight, or perhaps retirement. No matter how old you are, now is the time to plan for retirement. So, what are your plans? And how important are your plans? What would, how would you feel if suddenly all of your plans crashed? How would you feel? How would you feel toward God? Well, in addition to two people whose plans radically changed. Luke chapter 1, verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now, Gabriel announces to Zechariah that his plans are going to change radically. For years, he wanted to have a child. And now, out of nowhere, the angel says, despite the fact that you're very old, you're gonna, your wife is going to have children. And not only will she have a child, but this child will be the forerunner of the Messiah. And of course, an unexpected child is a major lifestyle change for Zachariah and his wife Elizabeth. And the angel adds this one punctuation. He says, you will have joy and gladness. Praise the Lord. And you know, if you've had the privilege of raising children, there's a lot of joy and a lot of gladness. And yes, there are tears. But there's so much joy. Zechariah will eventually recognize the link between the birth of his son John and the coming Messiah. Now, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 50, is the story gets even better. That's where Gabriel makes his announcement to Mary. And it's interesting that the nowhere in his discussion with Mary does he mention those two words, joy and gladness. Because for in the time of Israel, for a young girl to become pregnant outside of Midlock, well, that could mean stoning. Very problematic. Not so much for a barren woman of, of, of age as Elizabeth was. But God changed Zechariah's plans, but he also changed Mary's plans drastically. 
the scripture helps us understand how she would respond and why she would respond and how that is a blessing to us. There are two focuses we're going to look at this morning. One is God's inconvenient grace and the joy of humility. So let's look at first God's inconvenient grace. Verse 26 tells us that Elizabeth is about six months pregnant. She has remained in seclusion, not telling anybody about her pregnancy. Even Mary didn't know at this time. And the announcement of Zechariah and Mary parallel each other. Zechariah's announcement is in Jerusalem. It's in the, the heart of the Israeli culture. Whereas, Ruth, whereas Mary's announcement is in a small Galilean town. What is to a man and what is to a woman? Gabriel goes to Mary in Nazareth. And remember, it's Nan Nathaniel who would later become one of the apostles who would say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Gabriel goes to Mary. Remember, Mary is betrothed to Joseph. And, and Joseph is a descendant of David. That sounds pretty impressive, the descendant of the king of David, but in reality, it wasn't all that impressive because there were, David had hundreds of descendants, and none of them had ever ruled as a king in Israel. And the king of Israel, King Herod, wasn't even Jewish. In fact, he was really a, a puppet of Rome. So Gabriel appears, verse 30. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. The Bible doesn't tell us how old Mary is. But if we go by their culture of that day, usually girls were betrothed or engaged by the time they were 12 years of age. And then they would be married one year later. So therefore Mary is probably in her early teens. Quite a contrast to her relative Elizabeth. Verse 7 says Elizabeth was well advanced in age. It's understandable that Mary would be frightened because she couldn't figure out how she could be favored, how she could be recipient of God's grace. And Gabriel continues in verse 30, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. <laughs> now, finding favor with God is a common Old Testament expression. The Old Testament, which is written in Hebrew, is also translated into Greek. That's the same word that's used in the Old Testament, Greek, as found here in the New Testament. It's an expression of finding favor with, with men and with God. It doesn't mean being full of grace. Genesis 6, for example, Noah is said to have found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Moses is said to have found favor with God in Exodus 33. But neither Noah nor Moses merited God's favor. He showed grace on them. And Gabriel is saying to Mary, Mary, God is going to show you an unimaginable grace. Mm, yeah. God is going to give you a privilege far beyond your deserving, and it will be so, so amazing, it will be overwhelming. Verse 31, the angel explains this grace. He says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. 
The Jews have been waiting for a hundred years, or have been waiting hundreds of years for the promised king. Mary now hears the angel say, Mary now hears the angel say that her son is the long-awaited Messiah. A young girl from nowhere, a girl with no promise, chosen by God to be the mother of Jesus, to be the mother of the Messiah. Amen. Now remember how Zechariah responded? In verse 18 says, how is this possible? But he was, one, not, only he was, not only was he only one in a sign from the angel, he was challenging the credentials of Gabriel. But Mary doesn't ask for a sign. But she's, she is simply confused. And for good reason. In verse 34 she says, How will this be since I'm a virgin? She said, you know, I understand biology, but I don't understand this. So in verse 35, the angel answers, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. That word overshadow makes it kind of a strange word. It's used several times in Scripture to signify God's presence. For example, when the, when the Israelites had completed the sanctuary, the cloud of God's glory overshadowed the sanctuary. And the Greek Old Testament, the Greek, was translated the Old Testament, found in Greek. The same word is used as found in Luke 9.34, right before, as Peter and James and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration, just right before God speaks to them out of the cloud. Thus overshadow draws an attention to the miracle of God's presence with Mary. Mary didn't ask for a sign, as Zachariah did, but God chooses to give her a sign. Notice in verse 37, he says, nothing will be impossible with God. Now Mary had two choices here. She had the option of two responses. She could have said, what, me? Pregnant? No, no. Or she could have said, what would Joseph think? Or more frightening, what would her parents think? She could have said, you know, I was thinking of just enjoying a great life as the carpenter's wife. Or she could have said, can't you find somebody else? In effect, that's how Moses answered it. How would you respond? When God convicts you of sin in your life, or convicts you in your pursuit of Him, do you respond, well, you know, that's a great idea, God. Why don't you ask somebody else? But notice how Mary responds in verse 38. I am the Lord's slave. Let it be to me according to your word. Isn't that amazing? The kind of courage. That's the kind of response God is looking from us. To be His kind of people. That's the last day people's response. Mary receives great grace from God. The privilege of bearing the long awaited Messiah. A great, inconvenient privilege. Because this was nowhere on her radar screen. She had a lot of expectations. She had a lot of plans. But Mary shows great faith and great wisdom for a young teenage girl. She has faith in God. Faith that God will be faithful to His promises. Amen. She has faith to see the wisdom of God. And she learned this through her private devotions 
with her Lord. She learned about his character. And she was ready to respond with wisdom and faith. The question is all we read. Do we know God enough that we're ready to respond with faith and with wisdom? Now let's transition to the joy of humility. Mary knows she's about to get, Mary knows that she is to become pregnant. Verse 39 says that she went with haste to Elizabeth's house. Because who else would believe her story that the Holy Spirit got her pregnant? And who else would share, share her joy? So Mary enters Elizabeth's house. Notice verse 41. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 42. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. 43. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? 44. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Elizabeth's response makes it clear that she understands that Mary is bearing the Messiah. And then verse 44 shares why she comes to this conclusion. Verse 45 says, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Mary is a woman of faith. She believes, she acts on that faith, even though it's going to turn her life upside down. Because she's a woman of faith. She is a wonderful example for us to follow. In verse 46, she says, My soul magnifies the Lord. Verse 47, My spirit rejoices in the Lord. And these two verses parallel each other. Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord. And then she restates it. My spirit rejoices in, my, in God, my Savior. Magnifying and rejoicing. And Mary magnifies God by her joy. Because if Mary had said, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll do this. I don't want to do it, but I'll do it. And if she moped and pouted and complained, she would be diminishing God's glory. But she chose to be a woman of faith. She sees that God has lifted her out of her mundane life and given her a special task. A great task. He planted the baby in her womb and will do, she will do whatever is necessary to fulfill His will. She rejoices. She magnifies God. In verse 48, it says, For He has looked upon the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Verse 49, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. God looked upon Mary at her humble estate. He could have glanced at her and said, I don't think so. She's humble. Her town's too small. Her parents are too unimportant. But instead, he looked at her and he chose this unexpected young girl. He did not look away, rejected her because she appeared to be a nobody in the eyes of the world. Mary says, I may not be important. My plans are not important. But God is everything. He is mighty and he has done a great thing. So now that everyone throughout generations will speak of Mary's name. 
And she concludes in verse 52, Holy is His name. Mary recognizes that she's not holy, but this great God is holy, and just, and merciful. And He has empowered her on a great journey and a great mission. And she rejoices in the honor and the privilege that she has. She doesn't understand it all. She can't explain it all. But she offers praise to God because she knows He understands. Verses 51 through 53. There are three questions we want to answer. What, when, and who? Let's start with verse 50. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Now, this is a scripture that's an allusion to Psalms 103, verse 17. It says, But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to his children children. So first, what is the theme? The theme is God's mercy, his steadfast love, his covenant love, his faithfulness to his promises expressed that he expresses to his people. When is the mercy expressed? Well Mary says from generation to generation. The psalmist says from everlasting to everlasting. That is, God is always working on His people, even though for, from the close of the Old Testament to the open New Testament, it's a 400 year span. And there had not been one prophet speaking. And in all of that time, God was working. Amen. God is working today in your life, in my life. Yes. And then, to whom is this mercy expressed? Mary doesn't say he expressed his mercy to all of Abraham's physical descendants, but to those who fear him. Now this fear is described in Proverbs 1 verse 17. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and destruction. So this word fear doesn't necessarily mean terror. It also suggests the concept of being in awe of our God. When Jesus comes into glory, his people will say, This is the Lord who made for me. The unrighteous will fear the Lord because they cannot stand in his presence. So those who are trusting God, fear is a sense of awe. Fear leads us to keep God's covenants. Psalms 103, verse 18 says, To such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. Now let's look at verses 54 and 55. He has helped his servant and is he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to his fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring. What is the theme? The theme is his mercy and covenant. Excuse me. To whom? To whom is it expressed? To the people of Israel. To his covenant people. To God's lasting people. The promises of Israel are not for all nations. The promises are for those who trust God. Verse 51, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. God is the only one who is strong. That's what Mary's trying to tell us. And he takes us in our weakness, like he took Mary, Esther, David, and Daniel, and he exalts them 
just as he exalts us. He is the source of our strength. He is the source of our righteousness. And he takes the proud and the mighty like Pharaoh, like Nebuchadnezzar and Jezebel, and he humbles them, showing them that their power is powerless. That their worldly power, that their worldly accomplishments, that their worldly pride is nothing. And Mary is reminding us that God is faithful in keeping his promises. He is faithful and just in keeping his she recognizes that she deserves nothing. But she praises God for what he has given her. She could have complained. She could have focused on her plans as if her plans were more important than burying the Messiah. But she rejoices in her God. She rejoices in the future hope of the Messiah. She humbles herself and she magnifies herself. Or she magnifies God. Oh, excuse me. She magnifies God. So we have a choice. <clears throat> we can be in love with our plans, or we can be in love with God's plans. We can choose to complain, or we can magnify God. Because He is mighty, He is faithful, and He is faithful to His promises. But you might say, well, God's never going to call, ask me to be the mother of Jesus Christ. Well, I can assure you that will never happen. <laughs> but God does have great plans for you. God has a task that he needs you to be faithful to. Just as he gave this task to Mary, he has tasks for you for sharing his love with your family, with your friends, with your neighbors, the people you work with. The angel tells Mary that her son will become the king of David, or David's king. But she doesn't know what that means yet. In her mind, when she says that he is a descendant of David, He'll be the next king of Israel, and his kingdom will last for eternity. She has in her mind what a king is like, a royalty, a pomp, and a circumstance. But she will see her son do things that she doesn't understand. She'll see her son misunderstood by the religious leaders, and she will see her son whipped and crucified. Mary found favor with God. But finding faith with God did not lead to an easy life for Mary. And oftentimes it doesn't lead to an easy life for us. But when she said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She didn't understand everything. But she knew that she could trust God to be faithful. And we need to learn from her experience, from her humility. I want to close this message. No, I want to close this message with a video.
Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you.